Chapter Number Four of The Altar of the Dead by Henry James. Every year, the day he walked back from the great graveyard, he went to church as he had done the day his idea was born. It was on this occasion, as it happened, after a year had passed, that he began to observe his altar to be haunted by a worshipper at least as frequent as himself. Others of the faithful, and in the rest of the church, came and went, appealing sometimes when they disappeared to a vague or to a particular recognition. But this unfailing presence was always to be observed when he arrived, and still in possession when he departed. He was surprised the first time at the promptitude with which it assumed an identity for him, the identity of the lady whom, two years before, on his anniversary, he had seen so intensely bowed, and of whose tragic face he had had so flitting a vision. Given the time that had passed, his recollection of her was fresh enough to make him wonder. Of himself she had, of course, no impression, or rather had had none at first. The time came when her manner of transacting her business suggested her having gradually guessed his call to be of the same order. She used his altar for her own purpose. He could only hope that, sad and solitary as she always struck him, she used it for her own dead. There were interruptions, infidelities, all on his part, calls to other associations and duties, but as the months went on he found her whenever he returned and he ended by taking pleasure in the thought that he had given her almost the contentment he had given himself. They worshipped side by side so often that there were moments when he wished he might be sure so straight did their prospects stretch away of growing old together in their rights. She was younger than he, but she looked as if her dead were at least as numerous as his candles. She had no color, no sound, no fault, and another of the things about which he had made up his mind was that she had no fortune. Always black-robed, she must have had a succession of sorrows. People weren't poor, after all, whom so many losses could overtake. They were positively rich when they had had so much to give up. But the air of this devoted and indifferent woman, who always made in any attitude a beautiful accidental line, conveyed somehow to Stransom that she had known more kinds of troubles than one. He had a great love of music and little time for the joy of it, but occasionally, when workaday noises were muffled by Saturday afternoons, he used to come back to him that there were glories. There were, moreover, friends who reminded him of this, and side by side with whom he found himself sitting out concerts. On one of these winter afternoons, in St. James Hall, he became aware, after he had seated himself, that the lady he had so often seen at church was in the place next him, and was evidently alone, as he also this time happened to be. She was at first too absorbed in the consideration of the program to heed him, but when she at last glanced at him, he took advantage of the movement to speak to her, greeting her with the remark that he felt as if he already knew her. She smiled as she said, Oh yes, I recognize you. Yet in spite of this admission of long acquaintance, it was the first he had seen her smile. The effect of it was suddenly to contribute more to that acquaintance than all the previous meetings had done. He hadn't taken in, he said to himself, that she was so pretty. Later, that evening, it was while he rolled along in a hansom on his way to dine out, he added that he hadn't taken in that she was so interesting. The next morning, in the midst of his work, he quite suddenly and irrelevantly reflected that his impression of her, beginning so far back, was like a winding river that had at last reached the sea. His work, in fact, was blurred a little all that day by the sense of what had now passed between them. It wasn't much, but had just made the difference. They had listened together to Beethoven and Schumann. They had talked in the pauses, and at the end, when at the door, to which they moved together, he had asked her if he could help her in the matter of getting away. She had thanked him and put up her umbrella, slipping into the crowd without an allusion to their meeting yet again, and leaving him to remember at leisure that not a word had been exchanged about the usual scene of that coincidence. This omission struck him now as natural, and then again as perverse. She mightn't in the least have allowed his warrant for speaking to her, and yet if she hadn't, he would have judged her an underbred woman. 
It was odd that when nothing had really ever brought them together, he should have been able successfully to assume that they were in a manner old friends, that this negative quantity was somehow more than they could express. His success, it was true, had been qualified by her quick escape, so that there grew up in him an absurd desire to put it to some better test. Save in so far as some other poor chance might help him, such a test could be only to meet her afresh at church. Left to himself, he would have gone to church that very afternoon, just for the curiosity of seeing if he should find her there. But he wasn't left to himself, a fact he discovered quite at the last, after he had virtually made up his mind to go. The influence that kept him away really revealed to him how little to himself his dead ever left him. He went only for them, for nothing else in the world. The force of this revulsion kept him away ten days. He hated to connect the place with anything but his offices, or to give a glimpse of the curiosity that had been on the point of moving him. It was absurd to weave a tangle about a manner so simple as a custom of devotion that might with ease have been daily or hourly, yet the tangle got itself woven. He was sorry, he was disappointed. It was as if a long happy spell had been broken and he had lost the familiar security. At the last, however, he asked himself if he was to stay away forever from the fear of this muddle about motives. After an interval, neither longer nor shorter than usual, he re-entered the church with a clear conviction that he should scarcely heed the presence or the absence of the lady of the concert. This indifference didn't prevent his at once noting that for the only time since he had first seen her she wasn't on the spot. He had now no scruple about giving her time to arrive, but she didn't arrive, and when he went away, still missing her, he was profanely and consentingly sorry. If her absence made the tangle more intricate, that was all her own doing. By the end of another year it was very intricate indeed. But by that time he didn't in the least care, and it was only his cultivated consciousness that had given him scruples. Three times in three months he had gone to church without finding her, and he felt he hadn't needed these occasions to show him his suspense had dropped. Yet it was incongruously not indifference, but a refinement of delicacy that had kept him from asking the sacristan who would, of course, immediately have recognized his description of her, whether she had been seen at other hours. His delicacy had kept him from asking any question about her at any time, and it was exactly the same virtue that had left him so free to be decently civil to her at the concert. This happy advantage now served him anew, enabling him, when she finally met his eyes, it was after a fourth trial, to predetermine quite fixedly his awaiting her retreat, he joined her in the street, as soon as she had moved, asking her if he might accompany her a certain distance. With her placid permission, he went as far as a house in the neighborhood at which she had business. She let him know it was not where she lived. She lived, as she said, in a mere slum with an old aunt, a person in connection with whom she spoke of the engrossment of humdrum duties and regular occupations. She wasn't the morning niece in her first youth and her vanished freshness had left something behind that, for Stransom represented the proof it had been tragically sacrificed. Whatever she gave him the assurance of, she gave without references. She might have been a divorced duchess, she might have been an old maid who taught the harp. End of chapter 4